Hi, I'm Gareth Green. Welcome to another video in our series looking inside the mind of Beethoven. That's a bit of a claim, isn't it? And I can't literally expect to be looking inside the mind of Beethoven, but what we're really trying to do is to get behind what was going on when he was writing and what can we learn from that about Beethoven? What can we learn from that about our own writing if we're composers? And if we're performers, well, it helps us to get behind really what was the purpose of the music and what was the composer kind of going about in the design of the piece. So we're going to be having a look at the opening of Beethoven's Opus 79 Piano Sonata in this video, written in 1809, and this is one of his shortest sonatas. And it's very much looking back to his kind of classical period inheritance. We often talk about Beethoven as the bridge composer. He's the key composer who bridges the classical period with the romantic period. And uh, in other videos we're looking at how radical Beethoven is in exploring new ways of writing for the piano, new ways of writing textures, new ways of dealing with harmony, with key modulation and so on. But we should never forget that he belongs to what he was brought up with, his classical inheritance. And that's what we see in here in this Opus 79 Sonata. <laughs> And so it goes on. So you see from those opening bars, you can get a sense of actually, could this piece have been written by somebody like Haydn or Mozart? Well, not quite, but there are certainly ingredients about it. Let's have a think about what some of those ingredients are. First of all, there's a kind of simplicity of approach to the melodic writing. If you think about it, we've got this opening idea in octaves in the right hand. What's that about? Just the notes of the tonic chord of G major. G, B, D. Well, G, B and then G, D. It's a very distinctive opening of that first melodic theme, isn't it? And so if you like, that's the head of the first subject, the opening four notes. And then we have a tail that runs off in quavers or eighth notes and comes to the end of the first statement there. And then when we go into the second statement, he kind of turns it round the other way. So we have all the quavers or the eighth notes first, and then we have the longer notes second. So that, that first statement is taking up that space. And then let's look at what happens in the next statement. So do you see how this is a kind of reversal of it? Because by the time we come to the end of it, We've got these kind of three notes that belong to a chord uh, just being spelt out in the same way that we had these kind of three notes spelling out at the beginning. But uh, he's done this sort of little interesting bit of symmetry in these first two phrases, hasn't he? We get those sort of notes spelling out the tonic chord as the head of the idea, followed by a tail running in quavers or eighth notes. And then in the next statement, we have the eighth notes or the quavers first, and then we go on to the crotchets or quarter notes that are spelling out the chords again. So there's a kind of pair of phrases that belong together. That's a very kind of classical design to present your phrases in pairs and to have these two ingredients built into the phrases. So that's one thing that's very much part of his classical inheritance. Notice another thing that's happening here is that we have this lovely little appoggiatura at the end of the first statement. You see that F sharp is kind of dissonant with the chord and then it resolves into a note that belongs to the chord. So this appoggiatura, this leaning note, very much a classical technique that's being used there. Let's have a look at the chords next and see what's going on. Because one feature of the classical period is there's a kind of underlying simplicity about the harmony. 
It's not that it doesn't use more complicated chords. Well, sometimes when Haydn and Mozart get very excited, particularly in their later music, you get much more chromatic writing. But underlying much of the classical period was a kind of rebellion against the kind of Baroque complexity and a return to harmonic simplicity. So we're in G major. What do we notice? In the first three bars, the first three measures of this, we've only got one chord. It's the tonic chord. Look at that left hand. That's all that happens. Everything else is just melodic or harmonic around it. So we've talked about these opening notes belonging to the tonic chord. And then as we go through, well, this is a passing note. This is a chord note, a harmony note. This is an accented passing note there. This is a chord note. This is a lower auxiliary note or a lower neighbor tone. There's a harmony note belongs to the chord, belongs to the chord, belongs to the chord a poggiatura onto a note that belongs to the chord. So you can see that all these notes either belong to the chord or they're justified in essential notes. So we've got chord one, the tonic chord, everything belonging to the tonic chord so far. Then hear how the impact of these in essential notes combine with the harmony notes or the chord tones. Dissonant, consonant, dissonant, consonant, dissonant, consonant, 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 dissonant, consonant. That's a very classical design, the way that that works. And it carries on into the next phrase. Now, okay, we said there was one chord pervading those first three bars, three, three measures there. And then what happens? Well, then we move on here to using a chord four. So a sub dominant chord. So C, E, G is our chord next. And that goes on for this period. It just moves at the end of bar four, but that's all that's happening there. Then really what happens as we go into the next bit? Well, all of this is chord five. It's a D, F sharp, A, and then we put a C in there as well. So it's a five, seven, a dominant seventh. Uh, before we come back to a tonic chord, at the end of that second phrase. So all we've had then in the first handful of bars of this piece are, well, they're just primary chords, aren't they? One, four, five, one. Running through all of that, just to make it a bit more interesting, you might notice we've got all these repeated Gs in the bass. You see how G keeps going all the way through here and all the way through to there. So it's a pedal point, a tonic pedal point. And that's why we end up with this chord four, this subdominant chord in second inversion, simply because you've got that G pedal point. And it's why when we get to this chord five, you might be thinking, well, you said that was chord five, seven, but that's D, a sharp A C, why has it got G on it? Well, with the G's there because it's the tonic pedal point. And then we get to a resolution there where the G and the tonic pedal point belongs to the chord again. So by having that pedal point when you've got the five seven, it's kind of warming up the emotional temperature in bars five and six. So you see how the G belongs to chord one. So there's nothing kind of tense about it. It also belongs to the chord four, and then it becomes dissonant with the chord five, seven. So we feel that temperature rise, and then it resolves again. So this idea of just heating up the emotion for a moment and then relaxing, very typically classical. Not overstated, but it's still there. Little touches like chromatic notes. We've talked about the passing notes, the passing tones. We've talked about the neighbor tones, the auxiliary notes, but you also notice there are little chromatic touches. That's very classical as well. You know, why is there a G sharp there? We don't need a G sharp in G major. Why didn't he write G natural in that bar? Could have done. But the G sharp actually sounds rather better, doesn't it? And you might think, gosh, it's quite dissonant when you think about it because G sharp's nothing to do with G major. We've even got G natural sounding at the same time. So that seems like a bit of a clash. But actually when you're going quite fast, you don't notice it. 
So at this speed, you can get away with that. Interesting thing about dissonance, actually, sometimes when you're going faster, you get away with dissonance or touches of dissonance in a way that you don't when you're going a bit slower. But that's what's going on there. So we can see all sorts of things about this from a melodic perspective, from a rhythmic perspective, you know, the simplicity of just using the quarter notes and the eighth notes, the crotchets and the quavers. We can see what's happening harmonically there. We can see the use of the pedal point device. We can see how those first two phrases are constructed. And there's a kind of sort of mirror approach to, uh, you know, the head of the thing being used first of all with the quarter notes, the crotchets, followed by the tail with the quavers and the eighth notes. And then the second phrase doing that the other way around but presenting it as a pair of phrases. Also, just look at that left-hand texture, this kind of alternating thing between these two notes and this note. It's a very typical classical kind of texture. I mean, often you get things like Alberti bass, where you take a chord and you go bottom, top, middle, top, bottom, top, middle, top. So this is not an Alberti bass, but the idea of taking the bottom two notes of the chord, alternating with a top note. So you get two notes on the beats, one, two, three, and these single notes between the beats, but between them spelling out the chord. Very classical that. And then changing to the next chord, changing to the next chord, and then breaking with that. So having done a, you know, a, almost eight bars of that, well, suddenly we've got these longer notes in the left hand. Now, one thing that could be a classical feature, but perhaps begins to move us away from it, is things like playing in octaves, you know, just slightly thickening out the texture there. Maybe that's something else that's just moving on from the classical period a little bit, having slightly thicker left hand textures in moments like that. But I mean, they're pretty marginal, and you could find episodes of that in classical composers quite happily. Maybe the idea of it being a a presto as well, rather than a slightly more moderate allegro. That's something else, giving it a bit more energy, a bit more drama, that's a kind of sign of Beethoven moving forwards. But most of the aspects of this piece are very classical. Let's move on and see what happens next. So if we look at this next bar for a moment, well, this is a tonic chord of G major, and the left hand is just very simply sitting on the notes, providing the chord. The right hand is going to keep busy with the eighth notes, with the quavers. What's going on? Harmony, harmony, chromatic lower auxiliary, harmony. And then this F sharp pulling us onto the G for harmony. Then in the next measure, the next bar, we're going to change chord. Now we're going to have chord five in first inversion. Harmony, harmony chromatic lower auxiliary harmony with a G taking us onto the A, which is harmony. And you see how these two bars are kind of related, that this is just a stretching of the previous bar, the previous measure. So one bar idea that gets stretched. So some of the notes are the same twice, aren't they? You notice these three notes are a repetition of these three notes. But when you look at these three notes, well, they're one higher when it comes here. So not just using the whole thing sequentially, but taking some of those notes, half of the notes effectively one higher, and half the notes staying where they were. Um, and you can do that in this case because you have a common note. In other words, this D belongs to chord five, but the same D also belongs to chord one. So you've got that common note that you can play with in that way. But it's another way of this time, instead of thinking, here's a four bar statement, and here's another four bar statement that is kind of making a response to it. Now we've got a new statement where the textures change. We've let go of all that activity in the left hand. And now we've got a kind of one bar unit, which is used again in the second bar, but developed. And then it moves on to the end of the phrase, in a way that is not relating this bar to that bar in the way that this bar relates to this bar. So in bar nine, you've got chord one, harmony, harmony, lower auxiliary, harmony. So it's the same idea, but just being used in a slightly different way. We're going higher, aren't we? And then just as you're thinking, well, maybe he's gonna stretch again. This time he just comes down a scale. 
So now we've got these octaves in the left hand that we had in the right hand at the beginning. So you see how that's turned over. And then in bar 10, we've got chord four with passing notes. So harmony, passing, harmony, passing. And then we've got this nice little touch with a C sharp that you sort of suddenly think, oh, we're going into D major, are we? Yeah, there's just a hint of D major into this cadence, isn't there? A kind of five in first inversion to one in D major. But Again, nothing kind of terribly controversial happening in the harmony. We're still dealing with these primary chords, essentially, aren't we? And if we've got a hint of D major there, well, what's D major? It's the dominant key of G major. One of the bits of kind of pinnacles of classical thinking is when you modulate, you modulate to closely related keys. So a little touch of the dominant there shouldn't surprise us at all. Then what does he do next? So we've had this opening idea, and then when we get to this from bar 11 onwards, well, now we've got a kind of almost monophonic approach where we've just got this single note. And what's all this about? Well, all these notes belong to the chord of D major. You notice every single note that I've just played all belongs to D, F sharp, A. So all of that is just simply saying, well, there's a bar of D major, there's a bar of D major, there's a bar of D major, well, there's a bar of D major. So the idea that we had all these bars at the beginning of the tonic chord of G major, well, now we've got all these bars of a tonic chord of D major. And this time, we're not really spelling out the harmony. The harmony is just being spelled out by the melodic idea, which this time is quite kind of broken chord. And then when they get to 15, there's a change of chord. And then we use the same idea going through these bars. It's exactly the same idea that we've just been playing, but transposed and used around this chord of B minor, which is chord six in D major. But very simple, just a broken chord idea, you see? Nothing over complicated, no harmony going on. And then he says, well, okay, that was a chord of B minor. Well, B minor was that chord six in D major, but B minor is also chord two in A major because now we're gonna get a G sharp and we're gonna wander off towards A major by the time we get to this point. So this now is all spelling out notes that belong to the dominant seventh in the key of A major. So do you see exactly the same thing again, a sort of monophonic approach? And then we get some chords that come in the left hand to just emphasize that. And then we get to A major. Okay, well, we've gone from G major to D major. So tonic to the dominant key. From D major, we've gone to A major. It's dominant. So nothing terribly radical. And actually, does it really stay in A major? It definitely kind of modulates to A major, but have a look at what happens very soon because we come down in this measure, this bar, with that dominant seventh in A major, and then suddenly we're dominant seventh in D major. Oh, and we're back in D major again. Okay, that G sharp is probably just a bit of a chromatic passing note, but it's hinting at A major and again, and then A major dominant seventh, and then back to the dominant seventh of D. So you see what Beethoven is doing there? A kind of nice little kind of interplay between D major and A major. So when we're hearing a chord of A major, is that really the tonic chord of A major or is it the dominant chord of D major? So here's Beethoven still using primary chords, still using his classical inheritance, but beginning to tease the listener a little bit. What do you make of that A major chord? Tonic of A major? Dominant of D major? Oh. You know, he's keeping us guessing, isn't he? And so when we get to this point, we're thinking, oh, it's definitely A major, because here's A major, it's got G sharp in it, here's the dominant seventh of A major, and then we suddenly think, oh, suddenly we've been thrown into the dominant seventh of D major. And he's marking that, isn't he? We've had that crescendo, now he's got an SF just to say, ha ha, G natural. So now we're back to D major, a hint of A major with that G sharp. A major chord again, and the dominant seventh in A, which he reinforces, 
over that a pedal point you see how the pedal points coming again and then we go into bar 34 and a major but G natural so it's feeling like a dominant seventh in D so you see how he's kind of playing this little trick with us and then he says okay let's call it a dominant seventh in D so all those notes are dominant seventh in D. And then he throws in a Beethovenian surprise. So here he's being a bit less kind of allegiant to his classical inheritance because when you get into this bar, suddenly, aha, a diminished seventh. Oh, that's a lovely touch, isn't it? So a diminished seventh in the key of D, okay? And then back to the dominant seventh. And dominant seventh again, last inversion, back to the tonic chord of D, first inversion, root position. Then he says, oh, let's have another crack at that. I rather liked it. Let's do it again. So we get a dominant seventh in D, followed by the diminished seventh in D. So you see the bit of drama, bit of colour. And then he comes up here and goes back to the dominant seventh again. What is he doing? Then back to the D major thing. And then he says, OK, I've teased you for long enough about the D major, A major thing. So we'll have a diminuendo and then we'll just have a nice piano cadence in the key of D. So chord four, one C and a nice little classical trill and a tonic chord. And then in D major, then he suddenly bursts out forte and finishes off with D major tonic chord, D tonic pedal with a dominant seventh, and then just these octaves, C natural, and of course that's taking us back to G major so we can do the repeat. On it goes. Well, we could talk much more about this and it gets interesting when you move on into the following uh, section uh, after the, the second time bar because suddenly he shoots into another key altogether and starts to become more adventurous. But there's so much about the passage we've looked at that illustrates Beethoven's classical inheritance. And that's really what I just wanted to talk about today. So we're just thinking about Beethoven, uh, obviously, being a radical composer, stepping forwards, kind of beginning to engage in a much broader emotional way through his writing than this slightly kind of step back from the emotions classical approach, but still very much belonging to this classical inheritance. So there are many more dramatic sonatas than this one, but um, if you're a pianist and you've never played the Opus 79 Sonata, you might like to have a look at this one. I think it's a rather beautiful movement. And what I love about it is the fact that it is so classical in its design, yet you've also got hints of the other side of Beethoven, little hints of romanticism to come, like those diminished sevenths that we talked about, some drama built in there. But a wonderful piece to explore. So I hope you've just enjoyed looking at the opening and listening to some of Beethoven's Opus 79 Sonata. Well, if you've enjoyed this video and you want to go a bit further with this Beethoven analysis, well, if you go to our website, www.mmcourses.co.uk, and you click on courses on the home page, you'll find that we have a complete analysis course of the Beethoven Pathetique Sonata, uh, where I pull apart all three movements from the point of view of melody, rhythm, what's going on with the harmony, keys, modulations, all the rest of it, how he works with the texture, what the structure is, and it really helps you to get inside the mind of Beethoven in a much deeper way. So if this is something you'd like to go further and deeper with, you might want to have a look at that course and see if it's for you. Have a look at the other courses we've got on offer while you're in there. Lots to interest the person who wants to develop as an all-round musician. You might also just click on Maestros on the homepage because lots of perks come with being a Music Matters Maestro and you can join a, at one of three levels. Uh, if you decide to go for level two, one of the things you can do is join us for a monthly live stream where we do a lot of this kind of thing, looking at music and going into greater detail as to what's going on in the style of the music, how it's written, how it's composed, ideas that, that that might give us if we're composers ourselves, ideas it might give us if we're performers, 
and just insight into what a great composer does when they write a piece of music. So that might be of interest to you. And if you're a composer, you might want to join our level three group and have your own compositions uh, evaluated as part of our monthly live streams if that's something you would be interested in doing. Anyway, it's all there on the website. Enjoy.